Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Drive Pink Dialogue. We're here for episode number 22. We're going to do some soul searching after Wednesday night's defeat to Monterey, where Inter Miami exits the CONCACAF Champions Cup in the quarterfinals. It's Friday night. We're still a little sad based on what we saw over the last you know, 48 hours. But other than that, how are you feeling, my man? A little sad is kind of underselling it, man. <laughs> I'm pretty heartbroken, and I am very, very much off this Inter Miami team right now. Uh, not great, not great. The vibes are certainly not good right now. We're going to talk about it. We're going to get our feelings off our chests. We're going to do some soul searching in this episode. We're going to talk about Tata Martino. We're going to give out some awards. We're going to talk about the three five two. We're going to talk about. Um, everything to do with this game but first some house cleaning and we're going to start with the dry pink dialogue there will not be a pre-game episode tomorrow i'm being selfish and making the trip out to go see the game live so i won't be available um so at the end of this episode we'll spend some 10 15 minutes talking about that game and sort of giving a little bit of a preview and our thoughts on how inner miami can sort of rebound and get back to refocus on this season um listen if you go and watch the game live and we win then you know you got to go every single game right because that's how superstitions work i'm hoping that i can be a jolt in the right direction to get the guys back in the uh winning ways it's gonna be my first game of the season because we've been doing this uh, so far so you know every game so um i'm excited to go see it and i've never been to kansas city and this is actually my first Inter Miami road game that I've ever been on. So I think it'll be fun all around. Um, a couple of things before we get into the game that I wanted to talk about. The first is Matthias Rojas. Um, there was, I saw a tweet out, but I don't know if this was from a source that uh, Rojas is still planning to come to Inter Miami. They reporters asked Javier Morales, Inter Miami's assistant coach, about it today in a press conference. And he said that he didn't have any update that he could give. So that situation is still up in the air. Inter Miami could use a winger, and here they are. It's April 12th. The window deadline is April 23rd, and he's running out of time to make that happen. Inter Miami doesn't have a spot for him, so they'd have to do a corresponding move to make it possible. Do you think this is going to happen or no? At this point, we need at least five more signings. So bring me a winger. With Robert Taylor out, we need that wing threat. I haven't seen much of Matas Rojas, but it's a, it's a signing that makes me excited because it offers a different dimension going forward. I don't know if he can play on the left because that's a gaping hole in the squad right now. And we we really need him to come in and shore up the offense. Yeah. Um, I agree. I think he would be an outstanding signing if we could get him. Inter Miami did trade for an international roster spot last week, so it seems like... They still expect to add someone in this window, but we will see. I don't think that there's going to be a center back or defender coming in this window. I think if anything, it's going to be a winger. And if they can't get Matthias Rojas, probably they're just going to wait until the summer to do um, to do more business, at which point we could see a lot more, right? If this team isn't accomplishing what they want to accomplish this season, you could see a lot of guys leave, you know, talking about the – Sir Christoph or Nico Freire or guys like that could be out the door and new guys brought in if in the summer this team isn't where it wants to be. But probably that's a conversation for another podcast. Let's talk about these One Planet kits. They were announced by MLS this week. For those that don't know, every Earth Day, every year, the MLS wears a special one-off uniform for each for, for that game. This year, we might not get that. They released what the kit looks like. It's for Inner Miami. It's a nice blue color. Um, and I am I would be really sad if they don't wear this next weekend because I think it looks good, and I like the fact that they switch it up every year for, for at least one game. Yeah, I like a good alternative kit and like something that's different from the usual lot. And I'd like to see them play, even though the color is not entirely the Inter Miami color scheme. The blue looks good. The jersey looks pretty um, wild, but different. And I like it. Kind of nice. Yeah, if they do wear it, I'm definitely going to buy it. Um, 
I would love to get a maybe an Ian Frey kit or a um, Diego Gomez kit because uh, those guys are awesome. And this kit, I you know, I don't know if I want to buy it if it's just a pregame kit, but if it, they do wear it, I, I definitely get it. Um, and it would be a shame because they have done it each of the last three years, and so it feels like this is their sort of thing. Anything else you want to talk about before we get into the game? Because I want to delay that as long as I possibly can. Yeah, I, I feel the energy quite low. I think we're all just despondent after that win, but it's it's something that we need to get into, and I think just get off our chest. So let's just let's just start talking about this. Okay. We did a pregame show in the hour before kickoff, and we talked about how we felt very confident. And I spent 45 seconds talking about how there was a chance that Monterey kicked our butt. And we spent the other 59 minutes talking about how we're confident. We feel very good. We feel like we have a real chance to go out there and control the game and maybe even at some points dominate and get a bunch of goals. And it was only about, you know, can we make sure those fine-tuned moments go our way? And that was the only thing that was going to prevent us from winning. We had Messi back. We felt good. And then we saw the lineup. (laughs) And it was a 3-5-2. We didn't like that at all. Let's talk about the lineup, the pregame thoughts, and you know we'll talk about where we went wrong and how the game played out later. But let's go back to the pregame and, and figure out where we should have seen this going wrong from the get-go. Well, you mentioned that there is a realm of possibility out there where Inter Miami loses this game 3-0 or 4-0. And I was very quick to shut that down. And I look very stupid after that after that comment because I didn't think this performance would be as bad as it was. Uh, the three five two is obviously not the formation that either of us were expecting. I think we were both hoping that Alba would play that left wing role with Franco Negri coming in, who's obviously the um, he's coming back from an injury, but he played a full ninety minutes, and I thought he'd get at least some game time this this time around. Overall, I felt confident. I thought we were we were looking good going into this game, especially after that second half against Colorado, where into, uh, where Lionel Messi came on and he looked decent in the forty five minutes, and the team just looked a lot better. Boy, were we wrong because it went. This was a game that went nowhere for us, absolutely nowhere. And that was the thing, right? We we went live about one minute after the lineup um, came out, and we had dropped confidence significantly. And I think maybe we talked ourselves back into it over the course of the next hour, but um, we felt that was like scary to see because the 3-5-2 hasn't worked. And we'll talk about why it doesn't work and why it didn't work specifically in this game when we talk about the tactics. But yeah, we should have seen that coming. The things that we highlighted as concerns, Julian Gressel and uh, Sergio Busquets in the midfield together, didn't really play out as a, as a huge problem, at least in terms of transition defense, like we thought. Um, we felt like they had a lot of attacking opportunities in this game. That didn't come to fruition. Anything else about the high, you know, and we'll talk about the bench and the substitutes because that's always a, a fun talking point. But anything else pregame? Because I want to hold think- off on... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, before we get into the weeds of how the game played out and what actually went wrong... This game, this, this feels like another game where it was Inter Miami set up to fail, sort of. And I'm sure we're going to talk about this more. But it looks like we shot ourselves in the foot more than Monterey actually taking the game to us and beating us on their own capabilities. I think if Inter Miami had shown up with their full, I don't want to say lineup, but like their full potential and played to the way that we've seen them play against some teams this season, like. Orlando, we could have, we definitely stood a chance, but it just seemed like we shot ourselves in the foot and we're our own worst enemy going into this game, which, which feels really bad to say out loud. There's a couple other things I want to get out of the way before we get into the game, because I feel like they need to be mentioned if we're going to talk about this game, but I don't want to spend too much time on them. Um, obviously the field conditions were really bad. Um, do you have any comment? Because I have a, I have like a point about that, that I want to mention. But before I do, anything you want to say about the field? There were two instances that made me think, why is the field this bad? So one was, I think, in the first five minutes where someone 
scraped off a chunk of the field and they were just going back and repairing it. And I don't think I've ever seen that happen in a professional setting before where the field's so badly damaged in just the first five minutes. So that goes to show the quality. And then the Lionel Messi free kick, which he absolutely botched. And I've never seen him botch a free kick the way he did because that was horrible to watch. That was within his range, something that he would have definitely at least put on target. So seeing him scruff that so bad makes me think that it was a really bad playing surface. Okay. Here's what I'll say. <laughs> I've watched MLS teams go away in CONCACAF for the last five years and seen this almost every time. I've seen the U.S. men's national team go away in CONCACAF and see this exact type of thing happen all the time. When people talk about playing away in CONCACAF, it's not That's just... Amazing. It's not just playing against, uh, you know, Mexican competition, which is which is really good. It's playing against the surfaces you're playing on, playing against the referees, playing against the crowd, playing against fans showing up at the hotel the night before, not letting you get sleep, calling the hotel to make sure that you get phone calls to your room. It's trying to intimidate you while you're at the you know taking a corner. It is all of those things, and not every single you know every single thing every single game, but these types of things happen all the time. And I should have mentioned this in the pregame because this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that knows what it's like to go on the road in CONCACAF where Inter-Miami has a team with technical superstars and the, uh, Monterrey had a lead. So all they needed was a 0-0 draw. It is, there's no doubt in my mind that Monterrey's surface staff made the field worse over the course of the last week since the first leg. And it will be much better for their weekend game. I don't know if they play at home this weekend, but it will be much better for their next game in Monterey. That was 100% intentional. And that's what it means to go on the road in CONCACAF. And that's why you can't give Monterey a 2-1 lead or any team really a lead at home in your home ballpark because they are going to make it so much more difficult, not just by their playing style, not just by their talent level, but every little thing they can do to get an advantage, they will. That um, article about... Inter Miami's players going into the locker room to try and, you know, fight with Monterrey after the first leg. They made that a bigger deal because they wanted to get into our heads, because they wanted to distract Inter Miami. That's all part of Concacaf playing away in Concacaf. That's what this is. And so Inter Miami might play in this competition again next year. That's what this means. And you should never be surprised by anything that I just talked about because it happens all the time. And it's all fair at the end of the day. You can use all you know, tactics that are available to you and use it to your advantage. So fair play to them. They wrecked that field for their own advantage and they seem to have gotten the best out of it. So, And when you think about Inter-Miami, right? They, we needed to go out and score goals and we have very good technical players that would hate to play in a pitch like that. And so it, it makes perfect sense and it, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise at all. The other thing I want to talk about was the referee, Ivan Barton. I've seen him. I've seen him ref a lot of games. Um, he's one of Concacaf's best. I, I think he was at the World Cup. Um, he's done lots of U.S. Men's National Team games. I thought he was really good. I thought he really let the players play in a way that you would expect from Concacaf. Last week we got a ref that was giving out a lot of yellow cards, calling a lot of fouls. That surprised me, but I thought he did really well. And so, even though I don't think we got the majority of the calls or anything, I thought he did a really good job. And so I don't want to blame the referee at all yeah at no point in the game did i think that the referee was against us or not doing a good job i think he was anonymous which is the best you can expect of a referee and i agree with your point that he let let certain things pass obviously the jordi alba double yellow all this i i agree with that um at that point we lost our heads the refereeing decisions were definitely not the highlight of that game um hold on, let me just read this comment Um, yeah, the first leg ref, the ref in the first leg I thought was below par and I thought this guy was excellent. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. That's not an, ex that's not an excuse that I might have getting a second yellow, anything. I thought he did a wonderful job. Okay. Let's get into the game. Inter Miami knows they need to go out and score at least two goals. They know that that first goal shouldn't really matter because they have to go out and score two goals anyways. And so you would think they would come out and just be on the ball, creating opportunities left and right, making runs, 
uh, trying to create opportunities. And that's not really what happened. They sat on the ball. They held possession, but they weren't very penetrative. The first real moment, and listen, I can't rewatch the game because it's not on Apple TV. I don't have access to the highlight or to the full game rewatch. But the first game, the first moment that felt real for Inter Miami was in the 25th minute. There's some bouncing around the the box, and it gets to Messi, and he kind of takes a, a shot off his back foot. He puts it about a foot over the the post, and that was Inter Miami's first real chance to dictate what was going to happen in this game. Any thoughts on that first missed opportunity by Messi? Because it feels like that really could have changed the game. Yeah, just to your earlier point about us not being penetrative, and I I 100% agree with that. When we started the game, I saw us hold the ball well. We were doing okay in the back line. We were doing well in the midfield. The passing was not super slick, but it was there. We weren't misplacing too many passes. But as soon as we went from the midfield to the final third, it all just broke down. We didn't have any ideas how to play play there. And that was a big team throughout this game. And that in, that Lionel Messi chance was probably one of the better chances that we had this uh, entire game, especially in that first half. And I wish he'd done a better job with it because he was in the box. He's usually really clinical in that area. But it came from, I think, Jordi Alba making that run from the uh, wide channel on the inside and then the ball popping up to then a messy after a couple of bounces but yeah it didn't didn't end well for us it was a little bit over the bar but yeah i don't have the the times because again i didn't have access to a full rewatch but there was a point i think in the first 20 minutes before that that drake calendar had a really nice ball to get out of a little bit of pressure towards the halfway line probably to cello Wiegand, and i thought he like built some confidence from that and you know, with his with him playing at his feet, and then about five minutes later, he had another ball where he tried to do the same exact thing, and he put it five yards out of bounds. And they panned to him, and he looked like he lost his confidence immediately after that ball. And then a few minutes later, how is Monterey gets their first goal? Drake Callender tries to pass it out from the back, and we'll talk about trying to play out of the back in this game. Um, passes it straight to Brandon Vasquez, who you know, it's not a tremendous defensive play by Vasquez. He sticks his foot out, catches the ball, intercepts it, and then it's an easy tap in for him. Monterey goes up one nothing. 31st minute. Absolute disaster. I think Drake Calendar was really good before that because in the seventh minute, I believe Monterey had a chance. Uh, in the between the 10th and the 20th minute, they had a couple of chances where he saved a header. It wasn't as threatening. It was more offset pieces or a long shot that Drake Calendar had to save. But in before that first goal, it felt like Inter Miami was going to take their time to build into this game, but we were controlling it. I think in the first 25 minutes, we had some 70% possession. And I was hoping it was eventually going to translate into more chances and we were going to build out from that. But that one misplaced pass, which was an absolute disaster, as I said, but also just a brain fart because... There was nowhere to pass in that direction where he did. The player that he was looking to pass to was already covered and the angles were just not right. So I don't know what came to his mind when he was doing that. Changed the game completely. We'll talk about we'll talk about them playing out of the back because that was by design. He was looking for someone. He he was being told to play out of the back. He didn't go long virtually at all during the whole game. He tried to play out of the back the entire time. That is not something that a goalkeeper will choose to do on his own if he makes a mistake like that that first one because and um, he's you know it, that was tactical 100% of the way. And there was nothing wrong with playing out of the back. It was just at that point, he didn't have any we'll options. So as a, as a goalkeeper, as the first choice goalkeeper of this team, you need to know when you have the opportunity to play out from the back and when you need to just sometimes boot it long because all your options are covered and then I think he still had the option of Wiegand, I think, on the on the wing side, who was relatively free, freer compared to um, who he was passing to. I believe it was Sergio Busquets. But yeah, it just seemed like a moment of panic. He had, and, to, he had to go long on that. There was Yeah, I mean, he, he didn't yeah, make a very no smart call on it at all. Just, no doubt. Yeah. We will talk about Drake Counter more when we get to awards. Um, 
I'm sure. But I do want to just mention this comment from Skrilla about because we we both saw them talk about Sergio Romero uh, coming in, who's the Boca Juniors goalkeeper. That is a nonsense story. It's just some reporter trying to come up with a story. Drake Callender played bad, and Inter Miami is trying to do something sensational. He may be some option we take in the future because we sell Drake Callender to Europe, and that's where Drake Callender wants to go with his career. But Inter Miami is not going to sign a Drake Callender replacement to bench Drake Callender. That's just not going to happen. Um, the only other moment in the first half I want to talk about is the offsides by uh, Luis Suarez. Who I didn't think had a good half, but sort of in either in injury time, in extra time of the first half, or right before that, uh, Messi puts a ball forward. They kind of catch Mexico hot. I'm sorry, they kind of catch Monterrey high, and Luis Suarez makes a run. Mont uh, Messi puts it past their defense. Suarez finishes. It's called offsides. He is offsides, but I saw that and I felt like okay, maybe Inter Miami is trying to starting to figure out how to play against this defense, and it gave me a little bit of confidence going into the second half where. They're tr they might be starting to figure out they have to pull Monterey forward so that they can beat them in behind with clever passing and good timed runs. And then we go into halftime. And you told me in the pregame that we were going to get up a goal in the first half, and then we were going to score three in the second half, and we were going to win the tie. So I was thinking, you know, Soar is just on point, and that's exactly what's going to happen. How are you feeling at halftime? I was frustrated because I could clearly see that in the final third, they didn't have a plan. <clears throat> Whatever, whatever we were trying to do, it just wasn't working because we were doing, oh, as much as people want to crib about our passing being off, our midfield not being there, we were doing fine. We were being competitive, at least in the midfield, and the passing was okay. We weren't unnecessarily misplacing the ball. Sergio Busquets was doing fine, I believe, and there wasn't an instance where I was like, why are we losing the ball so much? Because I thought we were keeping the ball well in the final uh, in the middle of the pitch. But it was in the final third where we were just no movements, no um, no positioning changes, no running in behind the defense. And we we saw that if you run in behind this Monterey team when they are high, there is a chance. So I was really concerned about why we weren't trying to um, be more creative in that final third, especially with the kind of players that we have. And my idea was that going into the second half, Tata Martino is going to fix something tactically because it clearly wasn't working. It was clearly not working. And it wasn't necessarily on the players. I think this 3-5-2 we've, we've seen over the last few games, the 4-3-3 is obviously our better formation and we're just not right when it comes to the 3-5-2. So I thought Tata would pick that up. Yeah, I'm holding my tongue on that because we are going to spend a good chunk of time talking about the 3-5-2 and why it doesn't work. And so I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Um, but I agree. I thought they needed to make halftime adjustments because in this game, they had to go out and win the game from the very first minute. They had to go put out they – they had to have the game plan of going to score three goals. And what they were doing in the first half wasn't going to score three goals. You know, even if they don't give up the goal, even if Drake Callender doesn't make that mistake and it's still 0 0 at halftime, they weren't scoring three goals with that plan, with that style. And so I thought, considering it's a cup game, there's no, it's not an MLS regular season game. You're not working on anything. There's no tomorrow. They had to be aggressive in making changes. I wanted them to switch to a 4 3 3, take Noah Allen off, put on Franco Negri, and move him out to left back, and then have Jordi Apple play higher up the pitch. We didn't see that. They make no changes at halftime, and it was really all downhill from there. I thought they were even worse in the second half. Um, I thought Monterey was much better, and that leads to a transition opportunity in the 58th minute, and the ball finds Herman Berderami, and he has a, an electric shot, an amazing shot, right off the top post, down and in, um, from outside the box. It was a tremendous shot. Drake Callender couldn't do anything about it. Um, but that's the opponent you're playing in this game, and that was... Like that was always viable to happen at any point in either of these two games. Any thoughts on that goal? Couple. The shot was fantastic. I don't think Drake Calder could have done much. Um, I think Nico Freire went in half and half. He didn't fully commit to the tackle, and all Betarame had to do was just shimmy a little bit and make some space for himself. No, no other defender was trying to push into him to, you know close down that space so he had plenty of time to shoot that but that's what Monterey did they took their chances they were 
They were clinical in their offense. They were obviously they didn't need to take the initiative to score. They didn't need to take the initiative to make the opportunities. But when they got the chance, they just absolutely buried it. And that was a prime example of a little bit of slack defending, punished by an absolutely fantastic shot. Yeah, you know, it's it's a transition opportunity for them. So we didn't have a setup defense. I agree that Freire sort of didn't step up all the way to him because he saw that Rami was going to make a, a move to his right. He does make a move, and uh, Freire doesn't have the athleticism or positioning to disrupt the belt, to disrupt the shot. Good shot for him. And this is the type of thing we should have expected from Monterrey. They had two goals that were really fantastic, I thought. Um, in that first game, that second goal was really well placed, and then this game, this goal was just a firehouse shot. Um, two nothing. We need three goals now just to. It, it still doesn't really change much because it gets rid of you going to overtime. But as far as the as far as the score line, you still need three goals to win. And at this point, three goals is enough to just send you through. But. Inter Miami never looked like they were going to score three goals in this game. Six minutes later, Diego Gomez tries to make a pass. It gets deflected. The ball lands at the feet of Arteaga. And then he had just a, a nice little cross into Jesus Gallardo, who just uh, flicks it with his head past Drake Callender. Again, nothing Drake Callender could do. That's just a bad turnover at a bad spot. Your defense isn't organized, and there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, Monterrey goes up 3 nothing in this game, 5-1 on aggregate. And the tie is over in the 64th minute. Did you 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 knew it was over at this point, right? Oh yeah. The okay. worrying part was that at no point during the game, yeah. especially in that second half, did I think that we were going to come back. There were just no signs because sometimes as a fan, when you're watching a game, you know the buzz, the electricity of oh, we're trying to do something here. Yeah. There is a chance for us here. It just all felt so flat. It just felt like we were the second team through and through. And it was it was not a great watch at all. And I, I had given up after that second goal because at that point, it just felt psychologically too difficult. And the players didn't seem right as well. It felt like they weren't um, they weren't in the mindset of trying to get that turn, the scoreline to turn around. So Yeah. In this sport, in soccer, one goal can change the momentum of everything. And so when it's only that you need two goals, you feel like one lucky moment might be able to change your momentum, right? If that, if the goal we did score, and we'll talk about it in the, in the 85th minute, if that happens in the 47th minute, right after halftime, that could have changed everything. But once you go down to three goals, it's just like, it's not going to make a difference. And so um, it was over at that point. And you're right. The guys just all their only response was to get frustrated and to start committing more fouls. They didn't at any point have any better, better patterns of play or anything. We do score the consolation goal in the 85th minute. You know, Messi, it's a set piece. He puts a nice ball into the box. Diego Gomez uh, heads it to heads, heads into the, into the net three, one. That's the final score five, two on aggregate. Inter Miami is eliminated. Let's talk about Monterey for a few minutes, but is there any other moments in the game that you felt were even worth uh, thinking about? You missed the Sergio, oh, sorry, Jordi Alba red card. Yeah, I didn't even <laughs> want to think about it. Jordi Alba gets a red card, his second yellow, somewhere in the 80th minute, 75th minute, somewhere in there. And uh, we go down to 10 men. I but think that's the game was already lost at that point. Yeah, it yeah. just summed up the game. Not a great watch at all. Okay. Normally we would talk about the other team for several minutes, but let's keep this short because we're not going to see Monterrey again. I think they have every chance of winning this tournament. I really do. I think um, every team in the final four, at least three out of the four are really good. And so any team can win it, but I think Monterrey is probably the favorites, not because they beat Inter Miami, but because they are that good. Um, it's also very difficult to go on the road not just in CONCACAF, which we talked about at the beginning, but into Mexico, where MLS teams have historically struggled. Getting down 2-1 at home was disastrous. I actually thought it was helpful, at least for the mindset perspective, that we didn't get the result at home, because if we won 2-1 at home and we just tried to bunker in this game, I think the scoreline would have been the same. I thought we needed to have this very aggressive mindset going in, and I thought we would. 
didn't feel like it. Is there anything you want to say about Monterrey before we move on? Listen, you got to give them their flowers. That first um, game in this tie just feels a lot more significant now than it did at the time. I agree with you. I thought that there was still a chance to turn that around. 2-1 didn't seem too much of a deficit. But Monterey was professional. They knew what they needed to do. They had a plan in mind. And they did not get um, succumbed by the occasion. There was a lot of noise about Messi. There was a lot of noise about Inter Miami. But they came in, they did their job, and they left. And they were the better team over the course of two games, which is really, really sad to say. But they did their job, and they deserve it. Okay, let's talk about Miami. Let's have a nice, soul-searching conversation where we get our thoughts off our chest and sort of examine <sighs> where this team is. Let's start with this 3-5-2 before we talk about Tata Martino. Here's the problem with the 3-5-2 in this team specifically is because the best way to defend inner miami and well the best way to defend Lionel messi is to have all four of your defenders play very tight all within the 18 yard box very little space in between them make it very difficult to do anything through the middle and so the key to breaking that down when inner miami has been successful is to have a player on the left side spread the defense back open and force the at least the, the right side for the defense, but the, defending the left side, to spread back out because you have a player who's dangerous enough that you have to go guard him. When you go into the 3-5-2, you take that left winger off the field and you force Inter Miami, forces Jordi Alba to be the width. The problem is Jordi Alba is not goal-dangerous cutting on inside and being a threat centrally or at least in the channels his best offensive move is to get forward and then use that left foot to make a really accurate cross but that doesn't force the defense to spread out because as long as they play centrally they don't have to guard the pass if they guard the central part of the pitch and they defend all of the receivers so if they're structured well balanced and they're smart they can just guard the guys that are going to be on the receiving end of those passes. And sometimes it's okay if you have athletic freaks that can jump over defenders or, you know, basically that, right? If you have a Leo Campana, you can still put a ball in over them. It doesn't matter if they have four defenders. But when you're talking about Luis Suarez and Lionel Messi, who are space operators, who are trying to find good spots, good pockets to create plays, all they have to do is guard those pockets. And so they can remain very compact. And that makes it very difficult for Lionel Messi to be effective in the central part of the pitch. And that makes it very hard for him to be successful. And it makes it very hard for Inter Miami to score multiple goals and create lots of chances. That's why the 4-3-3 is so effective. Because specifically when Robert Taylor's on the pitch, he is he can cut to his left and put a cross in, but he can cut to his right, fire a shot, and he can cut to his right and still put a cross in. And so you have to go out there and guard him. That spreads out the defensive back line, and it creates space centrally for Lionel Messi and Luis Suarez to do their thing. That's why Robert Taylor is so crucial, but really that's why the 4-3-3 is so effective for this team. It also has advantages defensively, but for this game, we had to create lots of opportunities, and we never spread their defense out to let Lionel Messi and Luis Suarez create space centrally and find those pockets and do what they do so well because we didn't have any threat on the outsides that forced them to spread the defense out. I will stop ranting. What are your thoughts? No, I think that was a perfectly well summed up um, understanding and analysis of why we failed in this 3-5-2. I think that's you've put it really, really well. And I'm just going to add a little bit color to that because the point of the 3-5-2 is to use your wing backs as like bombarding down the wing and trying to create that chaos and that width and that opportunity on the wings the 352 is used to utilize the wing play but i don't think at any point during the game at least i don't remember where jordi alba or cello wigan on either sides were offensively threatening i i don't remember a single point where our wing backs were in an offensive creation position to the point that they were a threat to the Monterey backline and Monterey defense. And as you said, 
there was not enough threat for for us to spread their back line out and to create the channels for players like Luis Suarez and Lionel Messi to then try and create their uh, intricate little passes and offensive movements. What it does is not having those adventurous wingers and not having that, that width in the pitch forces Lionel Messi to now come back into the midfield and play a very deep playmaking position because there were so many times in that game where he was literally playing at that sixth position, where he was having to come down, force down into the midfield to pick up the ball and try and make something happen because we just weren't able to progress that ball. And because of that, we just lose that connection between the number eight and 10 position and the number 10 and the nine position. And this massive gap is why we are not able to progress the ball forward. Sergio Busquets wasn't able to uh, have enough balls uh, into Lionel Messi in the right positions for then Lionel Messi to turn and, you know, play around that number 10, number eight position. There were a couple of instances which I think were the best chance that we had when Lionel Messi had a really intricate ball popped over to uh, Luis Suarez, which we've seen them do so many times in previous games. But that was the only instance in this game that I saw happen. And so many times when Lionel Messi had the ball in his feet, he had to beat at least three players who were pressing him. And even then, there were no Inter Miami players who were free to try and to whom he could try and pass that ball because we just weren't using that width correctly. And because of that, Montreal just needed to be structurally sound, defensively solid, and they were able to stop all our chances. Yeah. No, listen, it wasn't that Cello Wigan and uh, Jordi Alba didn't go forward. I think that, you know, this chance... They don't chance do anything going about, forward with it. Th- right. And, but I think that's because um, the midfield wasn't creating good outlets for them. And listen... Monterey was very good defensively. They were very st- structured. They were very sound. And that's one of the other things, you know, when we play MLS teams, even if some of the attacking talent is as quality as, as Liga MX, the defenders aren't going to be because that's not where you're going to spend your first money. So for a, te- a league that has a salary cap like MLS does, the defending is just going to naturally be worse than the attacking. But um, Luis Suarez tried to pull guys out of position. Lionel Messi tried to pull some of those defenders out of position. They never bought on it. They didn't let Lionel Messi get on the ball up the pitch. They were on him. As soon, you know, even if we tried to pass him the ball into the final third, they were on his tail. Either he couldn't collect it properly or they could just intercept the ball. They were very smart about how they played it. Um, Cello Wiegand and Jordi Alba. Alba did get forward a little bit in the first half an hour, but I don't remember him having any possession in the final third at any point in the, in the last hour of the game, or at least until he gets uh, taken off. Cello Wiegand, he got the ball taken from him a couple times, and maybe we'll talk about Cello Wiegand when we get to awards. But um, So that's like the fundamental problem with the 3-5-2, though, is that you don't create enough width in a, in a, a dangerous way. And so that's why I hate it. There's also defensive deficiencies that didn't play out in this game but are a problem because we spread our defense out too far. But that's like the main reason why we can't create plenty of opportunities in the 3-5-2, even though we have seemingly enough talent to do it it just doesn't work and it's not well structured and especially when you have a Lionel Messi who loves to play centrally Luis Suarez who loves to play centrally you aren't creating an opportunity for them to be successful because your structure of play isn't spreading the field out wide enough and your players aren't doing it because that's not their skill sets and so it's just a cluster and so as long as the defense remains structured sound defensively and they play tight it's just really hard and we've seen nashville do that last year when they really took it to inner miami in in two games in the second half of last season is this is exactly what they did so every time you've seen inner miami struggle uh the alley galaxy did this a lot in the first game in the second game of the season it's really hard to break down with the three five two and so against this team it just it never made sense at all it's terrible just terrible you just need you need outlets at the end of the day and there are multiple ways you can create those outlets you either have runners in behind or you create the space in between to allow the your dribblers to try and run with the ball in and we just didn't have either of them and here's the other thing about this game specifically Diego gomez and julian gressel were at sometimes afraid to get forward because they knew they had a role defensively and the same thing with jordi alba and cello weekend 
all of them knew that they had to be sound defensively. And so they were, I think, hesitant to get forward, especially from the midfield. <laughs> we talked about in the, in the pregame how they have a goal to give up. And this, the reason why I kept mentioning it is because that should give you the creative license to not worry defensively quite as much because you have to go score three goals and you're allowed to give up one. That bombing guys forward out of the midfield from the wingbacks is like, it's okay because even if you do get beat going the other way, that goal doesn't make that much of a difference. And so it's worth the risk to try and create goals, even if it increases your risk of giving up a goal. And they didn't play like that at all. And that is so frustrating. And let's transition to talking about Tata Martino because I think he got every single thing wrong in this game that he could virtually, other than starting Lionel Messi. I think he was a deer in, in headlights. Yeah. It felt like he could just got paralyzed by the game and the occasion. We expected into Miami to start off like a firecracker because there was essentially nothing to lose. We just had to go out there, be creative, be aggressive, and just play football. And it just turned out to be a really deflated balloon. So, and I would blame the players on the pitch for not performing, but the system that they were set up into was not conducive for them to perform. And the fact that the first half, we gave up that goal, as you said, which we technically didn't make a difference as such. But you could definitely see the the issues. You could definitely see that there was something not working. And even then, the fact that you continue to play the same way, don't make a single sub. That has rubbed me off in such a wrong way because this is the game of the season. If you lose this, your your the start of your season has been the most disastrous with all the media attention and all the hype about Inter Miami just being for nothing. And the fact that you don't make a single sub, and he had the cheek to say that we had some of the players injured and injuries didn't allow, that's just, that's just BS. I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe we can talk about that quote in a minute. He didn't not just make any subs. He didn't make any tactical adjustments at any point in the game. Not a single one. And you mentioned that they had nothing to lose. And that's... It's not obviously this was a big game and they wanted to win, but like they came into this game already losing. It, it was already yeah. lost. And so you had to go win it. You weren't going to be able to just coast through and try and get a result, squeak out a result. But that's how they played. I want to talk about playing out of the back because they were trying to have 60% plus possession and they got it and it did nothing for them. Their game plan was to hold the ball, sit on the, you know, hold possession. Passed around the back, trying to poke and prod opportunities. It was, <laughs> in some ways, Phil Neville ball. Very frustrating. And they they knew they had to go out and get 20 opportunities to get three or four goals. And they didn't do it at all. And they didn't even try and do it. And that's on Tata Martino. That was their like They followed their game plan. And it didn't produce anything close to what they needed for this game. I am... <laughs> This was this was the worst Tata Martino game, at least in terms of if you include the stakes of the game, because he set them up wrong. It wasn't working at any point in the first half. The game goes worse because you give up Drake Callender gives up the goal, and you still don't make any changes. At halftime, you've created almost no opportunities. Lino Messi had one goal, but again, you a one shot on goal, but again, you need three goals in 45 minutes. And he makes no changes at halftime. Not just a sub, which we talked about what we would have wanted at halftime, but he makes no tactical changes. They just run it back out there. I, I'm like stunned how he could just do nothing. And I think you saying he was a deer in the headlines is right because he must just be sitting on the sideline thinking, why isn't this working? It should be working. And, it's, and he doesn't even try anything, especially once they give up the second goal. And now you are desperate for goals. Right, you're desperate to create opportunities. You're desperate to get forward. There still wasn't a lot of urgency. They still weren't playing more direct. They still were trying to play out of the back. They still weren't uh, kicking the ball long, trying to get the ball up the field. And I, I, I mentioned in that moment in the first half where Luis Suarez gets, um, he gets the goal, but he's off sides because that moment happened because Monterrey's defense had come high up the pitch, and there was room in behind for Luis Suarez to make that run, and so. To me, that was like any coach should see that and be like, okay, this is what we have to do. We have to bait them into coming high up the field 
and either go long past them or have quick transitions to get past them, turn, you know, turn the ball over and have quick, quick transitions. That wasn't the game plan coming out of the second into the second half. There was at no point any reasonable expectation that this team was going to score three goals based on what they were doing on the pitch. And I don't understand how you can just see what's happening and not change anything at all. Go ahead. We both like boxing. Mike Tyson said it perfectly. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. But when you get up, you got to readjust your plan and you got to figure out why it's not working. Tata Martino is a coach who's managed at the highest levels. And for someone like him to be sitting there on the bench, you expect changes. I don't mind if the tactics are wrong to begin with. I don't mind if he had a plan and it didn't work to start with. My issue is that the plan went out the window within the first 20 minutes. You had at least 70 minutes, if not more, to try and figure out a way to win this game, to try and figure out at least have some bite, have some changes, have some have anything to offer in the final third. You had plenty of opportunities to figure out how we're going to change this, whether it's with the subs, whether it's with the existing players. And there was not a peep of movement from that bench, which is absolutely striking. And I can it's something that I just cannot explain. And I would say this is probably 90% on Tata and 10% on the players. Yeah, I agree. Um, I just looked at the final shot tally. Monterey had 17 shots, and Miami had five. I think in this type of game, if you go 30 minutes and you don't have six, seven, eight, nine shots on goal already, you have to know it's what you're trying is not working. Because again, you know you need 15 to 20 shots on goal if you're going to get three goals against this team. So it should have been clear to a train. You know, I didn't recognize it until halftime or until getting closer to halftime, but an, a coach who's there watching everything live should see in 20 minutes that this isn't going the way that you need it to get the result. So you may shout a few instructions at that point, wait till halftime to make adjustments. But the fact that by halftime, he didn't clearly see this wasn't working is really, really disgraceful. I remember the first leg where it wasn't going Monterey's way. We had scored that goal in the first half. And we were very sound defensively. And it, we, it looked like we were on the road to a one nothing victory. And they were, Monterey's coach was very aggressive, bringing on two attacking players, trying to bring the game to Inter-Miami, trying to force changes. He did that in the 57th minute, 56th minute, when he made those substitutes. It, I, and I, I could tell in the moment, they're going for it right now. Like this is, this, is their, this is it. They made a change at halftime too. They brought in a striker in that game because it wasn't going the way they wanted. And the difference between how Monterey's coach, whose name I will look up, but um, Fernando Ortiz, the difference between his aggressiveness in making tactical changes in that first game and Tata Martino's total inability to do anything in the second game are so stark, it's embarrassing. I'm looking at the bench. Yeah. You got Leo Alfonso. Let's talk about the subs. Who's... Tata's definitely shown that he trusts because he's been brought up from the uh, into the first team fold now. He's played a few games. He's started a few games. Definitely a player that can offer some sort of dynamism. We know there's we know we're lacking that that final outlet, someone to run in behind. He can do that. At least he can occupy defenders and not have a final output. Schneider Bojelin, maybe not the first person off the bench, but. Again, a big, strong presence up front who could potentially occupy the opposition defenders and create space for Lionel Messi. Benjamin Kramaski, I know he's coming back from injury, hasn't play, played a game, but we know what a fantastic player he is. Yannick Bright was on that bench as well. Give Busquets a little bit of opportunity to run forward. Give Bright that CDM position. Allow Messi to play in the more 10 position up front. There was so much that he could do. Frank and agree. Yeah, and all of these players, I don't think any of them are like, this is a guy, this is the guy to change the game. But 
every single one of them would signal a game plan change or a tactical change that tells your team, okay, what we're doing isn't working. We have to try something else. Even if you do put on Schneider Borgeland, right? Let's say you take off Noah Allen and you throw Schneider Borgeland up top. That's you telling Julian Gressel and Jordi Alba and Lionel Messi, we have a guy in the but we have two guys, you know, him and Suarez Just in the box. Pop the bowl. Pop them in. This is our new strategy that we're going with. That's what you're telling your team by putting Schneider Borgeland on, right? Franco Negri, if you want to shift uh, Jordi Alba to get forward, you're telling him you should be playing in the final third or in the opposition half because Franco Negri is back there and he's a professional and he's got you, right? Leo Alfonso, this is a guy who can has a little bit of pace to spread the defense out. Maybe this means you go direct, you go with the long ball, you try and bait him in transition, right? You're telling your team this is a tactical change. So that's to me, like, I don't think there's any obvious substitute that had to come into this game, but the fact that he didn't make any tactical adjustment adjustments is what really upsets me because he just didn't do anything when it wasn't working. And so any of those subs would have been a, a change in philosophy that he was clearly afraid to do. And he thought his way was just going to work at some point until they scored the third goal. And then it seemed like he just gave up. I, I, I it's just, Un, it's just it's just awful man and to be a fan of inter miami and you know i get that people there's a lot of people that watch messi because of i'm sorry watch inter miami because of messi but that's not us like we want this team to do well and to be successful and to accomplish their dreams because this is our team and so to like see tata martina be like we give up it's it was just like it was so unbelievable and even then even when you go down 4-1 throw on the young guys just to see if they have some life and they can bring some energy and they can just have a have a i mean i thought the fact that he didn't bring in kramaski for 10 minutes was like that was like the one criminal. thing that i was really upset that was criminal. Because, you know even if you think the game's gone then throw out kramaski show him that he can be healthy and let him get this experience on the road because he's a player with a bright future and they might be back here a year from now maybe not at monterey but in Mexico in the same tournament, trying to do the same thing. And even 10 minutes for Kramaski would have been a good experience for him. And he just didn't do anything. It was so bad. And it's such a bad psychological signal to the bench as well when you're saying that in the biggest game of the season, you don't have anyone that you can bring on to try and make a slight difference. The talent's there. And I completely agree with you. We, we are all for this team doing well because we believe in the talent of the players. We know there's enough firepower in this team to be successful but when they're set up for failure and when they're set up to just die on the field essentially it really hurts and it's it's not fun to watch either because we clearly have the potential to go out and beat this monterey team and we're just sitting there with our arms up and hoping that we just contain the scoreline that's just awful to watch yeah i uh I think that it felt to me like once they scored that third goal and the tie was over, it was 5-1 on aggregate, it felt like Tata was like punishing the players by forcing them to stay out there. By the way, why is Lionel Messi still on the pitch? You know, like even if you give up, take him off and don't risk him getting injured. Uh, it just all of it was just gross. It was bizarre, yeah. Yeah, it was awful. I don't have any more bad words to say. Let's talk about Tata Martino for a few minutes, not in this game, but moving forward because I think we said everything that we can say without using bad language. Um, I'm surprised I haven't born yet. I know. I'm proud of you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> where, does, where does he go from here? What's, what's next? The result of this game could have changed our entire perception of how this season has gone thus far. But now I'm looking at the sample size, and there's been more instances where this team is playing poorly then they've been playing well. We've had to rely on individual performances, moments of magic to try and get a result out. And it doesn't seem like this team is on a trajectory that is positive in terms of how we're playing and in terms of how we're performing on the pitch. There are glaring holes that a lot of us can see as fans. We've talked about them time and time again, whether it's formation-based, whether it's personnel-based, we know this team can't play well on defensive transitions. There are issues all around. But how to use utilize those players and their best 
abilities and capabilities in the manner that suits them and allows them to succeed is the manager's job. And thus far, based on the performances that we've had this season, Tata Martino has really failed in that. And I, at this point in time, am not looking very positively on his tenure as a Inter Miami manager. He won the League's Cup great, but right now it's not looking great. If we go on and lose another cup, uh, another game, sorry, in the next two games, if we don't get all three points, this is bad. Like, it's a bad, bad start. Yeah, I want to talk about the League's Cup. <laughs> okay, let me, let me back up. I talked about this a week ago where Tata Martino was brought in to win trophies. And the minute he doesn't win trophies, he's it, everything's up for everything's up. Everything is up for debate now that they haven't won the CONCACAF Champions Cup. They prioritized this tournament. They publicly stated this is the one they really want to win, and they failed. And so now everything is fair game when it comes to Tata Martino. And I think he is now, as of the end of that game, a candidate to be fired if he does not improve significantly. I want to go back to the League's Cup because Inter Miami, that was his second game. The first game of the League's Cup against Cruz Azul was Tata Martino's second game in charge. And obviously it was Messi's first game, Sergio Busquets' first game. Um, Jordi Alba came two games later. And they went on this run. They won the they won the title. They played every three game every three days or so. And Tata Martino talked about at the time how it was really difficult to install anything in, of his offense or his tactics or whatever because they didn't have many training sessions because they were just going game recovery game, recovery game recovery all the way through. That continued through the uh, U.S. Open Cup semifinal, which was the first game after the League's Cup, and then three or four games later, they played the Open Cup final, which they lost, but they didn't have Messi. Is it a coincidence to me that the more time he's had on the training pitch with them to install his tactics, to get them playing the way he wants them to play, to give them the structure that he wants, this team has gotten worse. Uh, Taylor Twelman put out a tweet yesterday that his record in MLS play is worse, his winning percentage is worse than Phil Neville's. I looked it up this uh, yesterday or this morning. In the last 23 games, so since last September's international window, which is when Lionel Messi gets that calf strain, he's gone for most of the rest of the season from Inter Miami. Since then, Inter Miami's played 23 competitive games. They've won seven games. They've drawn seven games, and they've lost nine games. This is still a team on paper that, that has the most talent in the MLS. Even if you take Lionel Messi off the team, it's competitive to be the best team in the MLS. They have so many stars. They have so many young talents. They have so many solid middle, you know, mid-tier, um, like prime age players, Drake Callender, Robert Taylor, Julian Gressel, those types. This is still, on paper, the best team in the MLS, even without Lionel Messi, or at least, you know, top one or two, three maybe. And then you add Lionel Messi, it's by far the best. And they've gone seven wins, seven draws, nine losses in their last 23 games. It's not good enough. I don't want to blame Tata for losing to Monterrey because he could have done everything right. And we could have had all of our players and still lost to Monterrey because they're a good team. And as we saw, going on the road to their place was never going to be easy. But he didn't do good. He was awful, and he quit. In the 65th minute, he gave up. He didn't try anything new. He got it wrong, and he refused to acknowledge it, or he refused to try anything, and he didn't believe in his players, his young players. So I've never called for Tata Martino to be fired, and I'm not going to tonight. But from this point forward, every Tata Martino decision is scrutinized under those types of lenses because he was that bad and Inter Miami is no longer doing the thing that he was brought in to do, which was to win trophies. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I hate the manager out movements. I think fans are too quick to jump on and too reactive agree. in certain instances and very emotional on 
in how they evaluate managers because there's a lot happening behind the scenes that we're not aware of. There's a lot happening on the training pitch that we don't know about, how the players react to the manager's instru instructions we don't know about. So I'm also, I'm completely in line with you on the fact that I'm not going to start calling up for him to be sacked immediately, but he is under scrutiny. He has a point to prove and it's it's going to be investigative journalism into Tata Martino's tactics and his ability to manage this team from now on because he hasn't, he hasn't shown the ability to manage this squad properly. I kept talking in the last few podcasts about how I feel like there's something missing in this team. I feel like there's a sense of lethargy when we play, a lack of energy and dynamism. And as much as I want to blame that on the absence of personnel, for instance, like a fast-paced defender, I think a lot of it has to do with how the coaching staff wants us to play as well. Especially with, the, with yesterday's game, I think that was perfectly exemplified because... The idea, I think, is to be controlled in possession and try and hold on to the ball. But the way we do it, the fact that we don't do enough with the ball when we have possession, the fact that we play really slowly, we keep keep hold of it for too long and there's no end product with it, that's, I think, now starting to creep into my understanding of how Tata's playing with this team because I feel like he's giving them too much of a too many instructions about keeping the ball but not enough on how to use that ball properly again a lot to dissect over the next couple of matches we'll see how it goes i hope this team comes back and bounces back with a reaction but so far it feels like all the talent and all the positivity that we had at the start of the season has just been thrown down the drain it's really sad to watch yeah and i I totally agree with you on the, this idea that fans are too quick to try and throw out the the uh, coach, and that happens in for every team, seemingly. Um, but I have two things I want to mention about that. The first is that this Inter Miami team has a rare window. You know, if you are Manchester United or Real Madrid or Manchester City, right, you're going to have Phil Foden to build your team around for the next five years. You're going to have, you know, Chuamani and uh, Bellingham and Rodrigo and all of these guys to build your team around for the next five years, right? Man United, Kobe Manu, Garnacho, Hoyland, et cetera. That's not the case with this Inter Miami team because A, this is a selling league. So your young players are going to move on. And more importantly, you have Lionel Messi for the next 18 months, 19 months. So you have to make sure that if it's not working, you move on. Like there's a bigger urgency for this team than there is for uh, most teams. So I want to say that. And then the second thing is, to me, it's not about results. It's about pro process. And so, you know, I mentioned that they've won seven out of 23. And while I think that's like a statistic that shows the process isn't working, it's not that I blame Tata necessarily for that record. But then we talk about everything Tata did do wrong in this game. And by the way, this is the biggest game, right? This is the game that counts. And he got it so wrong. And so maybe we'll wrap up talking about Tata and move on to some awards because we still got to do that. But I'll just um, say the last thing about this team yeah, in ahead. general and not just Tata Martino, but Inter Mami season so far. It feels like even in the games that we won, there were instances where we weren't playing too well. There were instances where we had to be bailed out by Messi or we had to wake up in the second half and respond. And every game had some issues with the other that we were highlighting. And this culminated into the perfect storm where all those issues just came together and decided to have a massive party. And that's a really worrying sign because it doesn't feel like we're working on those issues in the training field and getting better. It just feels like they're all becoming more exacerbated as the games progress. So from now on, it's going to be all about trying to see the differences and changes in how we're approaching games and how we perform. And I, I agree with you. Results might not be as important as seeing the performances and the process and how things progress from here on. Yeah, but, you know, we go back to this last week's game, last weekend's game against Colorado, and we talk about how the team probably should have been a little bit more defensive in the last five to ten minutes when you already have the lead, and the only thing that can stop you from getting three points is a transition opportunity where you're not being smart with the ball. 
And that's exactly what happened. And that's something the coach should be in charge of. <sighs> okay, let's move on. Let's go to awards. I'm sure that, uh, well, like I said, we might have a Tata Martino section on every post game show, assuming yep. that we feel like it's worth talking about because uh, now it's it's real about Tata Martino. Let's get into awards. The first award, as always, is Miami's man of the match. This game, it's my turn to give it out. Obviously, the first five most deserving players for man of the match all belong to Monterrey. So I'm going to go a little outside the box and probably upset a few people, but I'm giving it to Drake Callender, the man of the match for Miami, because even though he had the absolute worst individual moment of this game, absolutely, no doubt about it, he also was the best consistently for the other 89 and a half minutes. And so this is more a reflect, and like in other games, this would be our worst player, Drake Callender. But in this game, I felt everyone was so bad that his saves and him being uh, effective, at least as a goalkeeper, earned him man of the match. How funny would it be if I give him the heron of the, the heron that went north award as well? He's he's <laughs> ineligible for that award because he already gets this one. No, he's not. He's not. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But I agree with you. Apart from that absolute brain fart where he had this weird decision making. I think he was solid. He had a few really good saves in the first couple, uh, first 20 minutes. And he didn't put too much of a... Okay, he, he definitely put a foot wrong. <laughs> I need to phrase how I'm saying this. He was bad, but he was not the worst. <laughs> Let's just say that. And other than the first goal, he wasn't responsible for the, the two that were that essentially ended this game for us. So... Controversial decision, but yeah, I agree six, with you. He had six saves. He had three saves inside the box. He had a couple point blank saves. He had a save that bounced right in front of him that he made a nice uh, pop over the top for. Again, if he if he doesn't have that that mistake in the thirty first minute, we're talking about how he had a tremendous game in this game. So um, I felt there was only one other player that was in consideration for me for this award, but he was almost as responsible for that third goal as Drake Callender was for this first goal. So I felt that considering that um, Drake Callender was to me the right choice. If you say that one other player was Diego Gomez, I'm going to walk off. <laughs> okay. Let's move on to our second award, which is the Heron that flew North. An easy award for this show because there's so many options, but that sometimes makes it more difficult. The Heron that flew north is our award for the player that's doing the wrong thing because Florida Herons, they don't fly north. They don't fly south. They don't fly anywhere during the winter. So who is doing the wrong thing? Who was the Heron that flew north in this game to you? Can we do 11 of these awards? Because I can give them to each and every single player on that pitch. I'll go with Jordi Alba. I think he had a really, really poor game. We've talked about how the 3-5-2 needs to utilize the pitch. And it could have gone to Cello Wiegand as well. But I think those two were responsible for creating that width, creating that space on the wings and try to be that outlet that Messi and Busquets could utilize to get some of the pressure off the central areas. And... He just did not have a great game. I think he didn't offer anything in the final third. Defensively, he wasn't as sound. Of course, he got that red card, which was a cherry on top, and not in a good way. And yeah, I, I can give it to anyone on that pitch, honestly. But he, for me, as one of the senior players, needed to do better. And it just wasn't good enough for me on that day. I agree, dude. He wasn't good. Um, yeah. It's there's so many players that had bad games. And I will say, I don't think they were set up to succeed. Like Lionel Messi is the best player on the pitch. And I didn't think he had a good game, but I don't think it's his fault. I think he was just put in a bad position and the structure and, and system that he was playing in was just And you could see that the players were trying to hard. Yeah, yeah, the players were trying. They were they were trying to, you know, stick to the plan and do something with the ball when they had it, but it just wasn't working because we were completely tactically nullified by the other team. And by our own tactics. Yeah. Okay, Jordi Alba, my first award 
is the second best ability? Have you done this award before? No. Second best ability. I'll give you a hint though. I the best ability is availability. Is availability. But the second, the second best, best ability is, is capability. consistency. Uh, consistency. Diego Gomez. No. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm giving it to Marcelo Wiegand. Ooh. Because I thought he was really bad. I thought Honestly, yeah. if I was giving out the hair in the flu north, I might give it to him. Mm-hmm. He was really bad in this game. We were really excited by what we saw from him in the first two games because he seemed like an automatic, easy upgrade on DeAndre Yedlin. He was good on the ball, athletic, sound defensively, well-structured. And in this game, he was really bad. Turned the ball over a lot. Wasn't dangerous in the final third. Couldn't get the ball forward. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was really bad. I looked it up what his uh, you know his scores were when he was playing for Boca Juniors, and this seems to be who he is, where he has some really good games and then some really bad games, and he's inconsistent. And that seems to have gotten him the bench and eventually the boot from Boca Juniors. He's here now. We were very high on him, you know, 72 hours ago, and now we're very low on him. I will say. In his defense, we had only seen him in a 4-3-3, and we thought he looked really good in a 4-3-3. And here he was asked to play a different role. So we'll see. But I'm now worried that he's going to be a very inconsistent player. And his bad was bad. Totally made that side of the field ineffective. Didn't combine with Messi or Gressel at all. Made them worse, I think, because then they felt they had to cover for him. And then eventually he was turning the ball over so much he was afraid to go forward. Really bad game. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, as I mentioned, like it could have been Jordi Alba, but it could have also been Marcelo Wiegen. That's a nice quote you have. <laughs> In my defense, this was a tongue-in-cheek quote, and it was meant to be a hyperbole. It wasn't meant to be him as one of the best <laughs> right backs in the, that have we've seen for Inter Miami. But I'm I'm sad that I have to explain this to the listeners. Um, anyways, I I wholeheartedly heartedly agree with you on this point that he had an absolute stinker. I think in the pregame we spoke about how we are going to be looking at the triangles between Messi, Gressel and Wigan on one side and then Suarez, Gomez and Alba on the other side and how that combination could really unlock the defence. And that was nowhere to be seen. <laughs> I blame I blame Cello. I don't think it was Gressel. I, I don't think it I was, completely agree it with was you. Messi. And a lot of that was because the fullbacks were not doing their job. The fullbacks were not a, not wide enough, and B, when Cello had the ball, he was giving it away. There was, I think, yeah. three instances where I was like, oh, I see that pass. He got into a good space. He got onto the ball. I was like, oh, make that pass. And he just makes a completely different pass that goes to a Monterey player. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah, so, his only, the only two things he did was either turn around and just pass the ball straight back to Toto Aviles or turn the ball over. Yeah. And for me, it's, again, I don't want to be like, oh, he's a really bad player from the off. I will call out a player when he has a bad game. I hope this is not a sign of him being an inconsistent player. It's maybe a sign of just the setup and how the team was you know, instructed to play and what it was. But he just did the basics wrong in this game, which really cost us a lot in terms of going forward and trying to make those op- offensive transitions just for anyone who's listening to this on uh, spotify or apple podcast later uh, <laughs> sore had a tweet at some point this week where he said that to quote he's played less than 120 minutes but i can confidently say cello Wigan is the best right back in inner miami history and then his very next game was that stinker uh, i agree with kareem here where he says that um we could have taken uh we could have taken weekend off and i thought that could have made sense moving uh, Julian Gressel out wide and then bringing Yannick Bright into the midfield. I thought that could have really worked, especially especially in the second half. But um, obviously, we didn't get any substitutes. So, yeah, the second best ability is consistency. And that goes to Marcelo Wigan. Go ahead and tell me about your first award. My first award is the Pendulum Award. 
Sounds like a consistency award. Is that Diego Gomez? <laughs> that is Diego Gomez. This is an award for a player that constantly goes back and forth. And we are both very high on Diego Gomez. We really appreciate him as a player. I think he's developing into one of the best players on this team in terms of his output and in terms of his impact. But over the last two weeks, he's had two very big blunders. Or the last three weeks, where it's cost the team at least a goal if not the result and that's where again consistency consistency comes into play for young players like him who are developing who are building building out and trying to make a career and maybe eventually move on to europe consistency is the key and he needs to figure out not having those moments that can be really really costly to his team did you think he was bad outside of that one moment I don't think he was bad in... I don't think he had a stinker stinker like Regan did. I just think he wasn't great. He wasn't I thought, good. But I thought he was good. Yeah, I thought he like, was... Well, by by Inter Miami standards in this standards, game. standards, yeah, yeah. I was going to give him our first repeat award, the Achilles Award, because I thought he was actually quite solid. At least I felt he was one of the only players that played up to his standard outside of that moment. And again... You can't have those moments in that game, but like we lost and it's behind us. And, and, you know, we've said this a lot. He's a young player and young players are going to have their ups and downs. And Dale Gomez is no different. He's 20 years old. He's going to have his good and his bad. And I'm just happy that his good is way better than it was. And his bad seemingly is not as bad. I mean, there was times last year. Except costing us the goal. Again, but that didn't cost us the game, right? The game was already lost at that point. And Based on what happened over the next 25 minutes, it's not like we were going to make a comeback. So you're right. You're right. It was a bad moment. Absolutely. You can't be doing that. But yeah. Yeah. I, my point was exactly this. Like he's a pendulum. When he has a big high, it's a, he's a fantastic player that can make the complete difference on this team. And then if he has a bad, it can really stink up the place a little bit. And, Eventually, he's going to get better. I think he's. this is going to be a learning curve for him and it's just going to get, you know, he's going to gain experience from this. And we just need to be patient with him. But it wasn't the best in this game. And even the last leg as well, he had that um, yeah. one giveaway that led to the goal. So it's going to be a lot of patience with, the, with a player like him. But hopefully, he can start cutting away these errors from his um, play. Yeah, and here's what I'll say. If a player has these types of mistakes... Um, three times in an entire season, you're like, that's a good season. Like, that's not a problem. It just happens that these both happened within a week of each other. And I, I meant to mention this in the Drake calendar when I was talking about Drake calendar, but every single player on Inter Miami passed at least one ball directly to a defender, including Drake calendar. And of course, when Drake calendar does it, it turns into a goal. But every single player on this team passed a ball directly to a Monterey player at least once. Most of them like three or four times. So Diego Gomez is no different. I agree. But um, I don't know. I'm not worried long term about this being a problem. And maybe if we see one or two more of these in the next week or two, then I would be. And maybe I would worry it was a confidence thing. But again, if this is the only two times this happens over the next three months, I wouldn't. It, it sucks that it happened in these two games. But I don't know. Okay. My next award is the Superman Award. Is this because someone has a kryptonite? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Leo Messi. It is Leo Messi because as amazing as he is, and we saw it Saturday night where we thought he's Superman. He's just going to come in and save us. He has a kryptonite, and that kryptonite in this game was Tata Martino's tactics. <laughs> he didn't have a great game, and I don't blame him at all because he wasn't put in a position to succeed. And... I understand that he's Lima Messi, so maybe you expect him to overcome being, you know, being put in positions to not succeed and just do it anyways. And he did almost score a goal in the first half, but he did almost get an assist in the first half. But even Superman has kryptonite. And so uh, if you're Tata Martino, and maybe this is the biggest thing regarding Tata Martino, is you can't get in the way of what this team is capable of 
and what Lionel Messi is capable of. And in this game, he did because he didn't do anything to help Lionel Messi out. That's my yeah. I watched this game with one of my friends, and both of us are Messi fans. And after like the 60th minute, we both agreed that as good as Lionel Messi is, you can't set him up in these tactics with the players that are around him and expect him to make the world of a difference. We saw this with the Argentinian team before they won the World Cup, before they had that really good squad that you know supported him around. He needs to have players that can provide at least a semblance of support. And seeing him struggle with three players on him with no out, out ball was really, really hard to see. And yeah, you you can't stop this team from... You can't be the kryptonite for this team. And I mean, you, Tata Martino. So we need to figure out how to best utilize the players around him and what formation fits us best. And for me, that's always going to be the 4-3-3. Yeah, and to me, it wasn't a, it wasn't a matter of the uh, the players around him. I didn't think Luis Suarez failed him. I didn't think I don't even yeah, think no, not at him all. because they we knew we had to go create fifteen to twenty chances. But in you this need game. to get the best out of those players as well. Like you can't set them right. up in a way that's going to completely nullify some of the, their capabilities. Right, and I think not only did we nullify some of their capabilities, I think we did the exact thing that Monterey would have wanted us to do to nullify yeah. Lionel Messi in this game. So I, I understand if you look at some of the advanced analytics, he still was the best player for Inter Miami. I didn't think he had a great game, but he's still Lionel Messi, but you can't get in his way. Like he still had an assist. So yeah, he still had an assist. So, okay. What's your second and final award? This final award is called the East Germany award and it can be assigned to a few players, but I want you to take your pick. Okay, well, have one in mind. Um, the East Germany Award goes to someone in the back line. Yeah. Uh, we're going with Nico Freire. Yeah, give it to Nico Freire. Give it to Toto Aviles. My point is that in the give first game... Give it to Freire, right. <laughs> in the first game, this back line was a wall. In the second game, that that Berlin Wall crumbled, and it crumbled bad. It fell down. It got beaten down, and it got broken. As good as we were defensively in that first game, as good and compact as we were in our setup, this was just the in- exact opposite. I just wanted to take a moment to talk about maybe two lines about the defense, because even though they weren't necessarily set up to succeed and we know this defense league's goals in that 3-5-2 it was just sad to see how good we were in that first game and if we got a different result in that first game we would have potentially played a 4-3-3 in this one and yeah it just feel, felt like we played two we, we played the tactics in the first game that we should have played in the second game and then vice versa it was just weird all around and the defense didn't have a good line yeah, I didn't get to watch rewatch the game because it wasn't on Apple and it's geo blocked in the US. But they did have 17 shots on goal. Um, they scored three goals. I didn't think any of the three goals, other than maybe Nico Freire on the second, was really on the back line. But they created 14 other shots, and I didn't get to see most of them. So, or at least rewatch most of them. But yeah, I didn't think it was. I didn't think they played particularly well. Um, and that brings me to my next point, that if we have one signing that make, we can make before the transfer window closes, what position are you going to pick? I, I think it's a forward. I think it's a winger. Um, I understand. I would pick a defender. I understand. I understand that. I really do. I think that if you could bring a top-of-the-board center back to the table, that would be amazing. But we have no depth at the wing at all. And it's scary. And we have been relying on Robert Taylor and Lionel Messi to be healthy and, and Julian Gressel, I guess, to fill in on the right side when Lionel Messi's not healthy. But we saw Leo Alfonso start one game. But other than that, we can't play with wingers if we don't have two of Robert Taylor, Lionel Messi, and Julian Gressel. And Gressel had to play in the midfield because David Ruiz wasn't available and Redondo was hurt. And so <sighs> Yannick Bright was coming back from injury. Karasik's coming back from injury. So Bring me Bambito, man. Bring me Bambito and we win it all. Well, here's what I'll say is I don't think they can 
I, I think it's going to be a lot easier to bring in a winger that's effective than it will be to bring in a top of the board center back. Like, there's Inter Miami can't trade for Bombito. Like, it's just they can't do yeah, it. Not possible. It's not possible, and they're not going to have the money or the ability to go out and get like some really nice foreign player. At least not until the summer. You know, maybe in the summer they can, but um, but I think right now their wing depth is really scary. And Robbie Robinson, I don't know what's going on with him. I don't know if they expect him back ever. I don't know if he's coming back next week. So to me, I would really like to add a winger. And um, that's what my answer was. Is And I guess this brings me to my question, which is who are we missing the most from the injury list? Because we talked about in the pregame how it was Federico Redondo, but I changed it, dude. It's Robert Taylor. Robert he, Taylor, 100%. He is the key that unlocks this team's offense. And you it allows you to play in that 4-3-3. Three, three, and he gives you that width because he's a dangerous player on that left wing. And Messi is a right winger, but he's really like a second striker. So you're not going to get a winger on that right wing to spread the defense out. So you need it to come from the left wing. Robert Taylor can do that. And even like a Robbie Robinson is not as good as Robert Taylor, but he can at least be a threat out there. But but Robert Taylor, dude, he is good. Has I'll, I'll output, just stop you there. Unlocks the I'll team. stop you there. We did an episode ranking the players in terms of their importance to this team. Everybody made fun of me for putting Robert Taylor in the top three. There was a reason. I had a vision. And that vision is becoming reality. He is the difference for this offense, especially when we do not have anyone to back his position. He is absolutely undroppable right now. And the fact that he's injured at the worst possible moment really cost us this game because... We would have a different formation. We would have had an outlet ball. We would have had runners. We would have someone who would run in behind the Montre defense. Uh, we would have won the won the bloody cup. We would have won everything. And yeah, unfortunately, that's a reality we don't live in. Thank you, Kareem. I agree with you. I definitely cooked with that. Yeah, dude, you're right. And this was this was a big thing I was on in the off season where there was talk about trading Robert Taylor and I thought that was just the dumbest possible thing they could do even worse than trading Kamal Miller because he is the key that unlocks your offensive potential because of everything we talked about with the four, three, three and the three, five, two, they are missing Robert Taylor. We have no idea what's going on with him. If it's a two month injury or it's, he's coming back next week, next week, I, we don't know. Uh, Redondo has gone for a while. He's but also a big miss. He's a big miss because he really makes that, but but I will say, like, we have depth there that we don't have on the wing. So Redondo comes out. We don't love Julian Gressel and Busquets in the midfield together, but you have a Kramaski now coming back. We David Ruiz, at least in the MLS play, can can do a job. And then um Yannick Bright is a guy we both like. So it just it's the depth really that makes Redondo more expendable. They wanted to bring in a winger, I think earlier in the off season, but it just didn't really develop that way. Um, any other players you want to talk about? Julian Gressel, Sergio Busquets. I mean, they, none of, nobody was like great. Nobody was even really good, but I didn't think they had like jaw dropping mistakes that needed to be talked about. Yeah. I think in general, it was just the team played poorly overall together. You can't, I don't want to blame one player entirely for everything. I think all players were not up to the mark and they just didn't show up on that team bus. So that's unfortunate. And it just worries me what's going to happen going forward because it really affects their confidence. So, Okay. Just to remind our audience, we normally do a pregame show in the hour before kickoff. We will not be doing that tomorrow night because I'm being selfish and going to the game. We will be back on Sunday with our post-game show. We will be back um, Wednesday for a, a midweek episode, fun thing that we got going. We got a, a video, just a regular YouTube video, 10 minutes or so, coming out on Monday. But since we're not doing a pregame show tomorrow, let's talk for five minutes about, maybe not Sporting KC, but what we expect from this team as they try and rebound from getting eliminated from the CONCACAF Champions Cup. Obviously, this has been an emotional podcast. We've been reactive from what we've seen in the midweek. This is still a good team. This is a team that can still go on a run in the MLS, 
we expect to make the playoffs, we expect to win the MLS Cup. And I think it's just now trying to take each and every game as it is and perform well. Put on a good performance, the results will come. Get your tactics right, get consistent. And the one thing that I've constantly been asking for is be consistent in the players and their positioning and where you play them and what their roles are. Give everyone a role on this team and we will start to see the output. I think right now it's been too scatterbrained and too haphazard in terms of what we're expecting from all the players. Obviously, a lot of that may be contingent to the injuries that happen and the fact that we have to play certain players in certain positions. But just get a consistency going, put on some good performances in the next few games and we're going to start seeing the results because this is still a good team. Yeah, just going specifically about tomorrow, we got the injury report tonight. Um, Campana is still going to be out. Kristoff, who seemingly was coming back, still out. Uh, and then Robert Taylor is still out, plus the long-term guys. So still not really a wave of new players, healthy players coming back. Um, Sporting Kansas City is currently seventh in the West with 10 points. I The one thing I really want to see is Julian Gressel and Toto Aviles and Sergio Busquets. Those three players, I want them to have a reduced role tomorrow. Not because they've been awful, or but just because they played so many minutes. Each, All three of them are up over 900 minutes. Julian Gressel started every single game. Toto Aviles has only not started one game. Sergio Busquets, I think, has come off the bench twice. But they've all played over 900 minutes, and I would like to see the three of them get a rest. And I think that would give the young players an opportunity. I would love to see Yannick Bright get that Sergio Busquets job. Um, and then, you know, I, I don't know if I love playing Ryan Saylor, but I just really want to see Aviles get a break. And then you can bring David Ruiz back in for uh, – Julian Gressel. So those three players I would like to see get a rest. Anything specifically about the game or about the team tomorrow that you want to see? I would like to see them go back to a 4-3-3. Um, but anything else? No, I think we've covered quite a bit of it. I just want a reaction. I want to make sure that the team feels this loss because if they come out and play that same cruise control, popping the ball around and not playing with enough dynamism and not doing anything in the final third, it's going to be another long, frustrating night for us fans. So, I will say, though, I don't need to see the reaction tomorrow. I think if they, you know, we, I, I've talked about soul searching in this episode, but if that happens over the course of the next week where they have a full week of training, right? Because they went directly from Monterey to Kansas City. If they do that over the course of the next week, they get back to training, they get together to huddle up and they say, guys, this hasn't been good enough. It's time to turn it on. I'm okay with a sort of I'm okay with a sort of okay performance tomorrow from the players if it means that next Sunday, next Saturday, they come back renewed. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, man. I think we've covered, we've gone on long enough for everyone. Thank you so much for the listeners to see. For sticking around um it's been a cathartic talk i feel better and hopefully we can get a few wins and a few positive podcasts forthcoming yes so like i said guys no pregame show tomorrow and i apologize for for that but we'll be back sunday night and probably with a tata specific segment but other than that you better lose your voice shouting during the game because i want to make sure you bring the into miami heat yeah i got my pink uh my pink pregame sweater to wear all right guys we'll be back on sunday night but until then i'm scotty and this is sore and this was the dry pink dialogue we appreciate you watching we'll see you next time have a good night